Hello, everyone. My name is Laura D. Gibson. I am the curator of Finding Home Stories of Displacement currently on display at Detroit Artists Market, running until May 21st. Finding Home Stories of Displacement reflects on stories of home, displacement, and memory while exploring narratives of specific marginalized communities in America through the eyes of local Detroit artists. Finding Home showcases work that advocates against displacement while shedding light on its historical consequences. This reflection is especially necessary during the COVID-19 crisis. Currently, I have with me today, Rebecca Maxson, who is a Latina interdisciplinary scholar, emerging photographer and organizer born and raised in Southwest Detroit. She is a third year doctoral student at the University of Michigan studying educational psychology, who is passionate about using documenting and scholarship as measures to uplift community-driven organizing narrative and storytelling. She is especially interested in how the intersection of these measures is used as a means to combat cultural, community, and racial erasure and injustice. Her current documenting work focuses on narratives around family and community healing in her hometown of Detroit. So again, Rebecca, it's so wonderful to have you with me today. And I'll give you the floor to talk a little bit more in depth about your practice and your current work on display in the Finding Home exhibition. Thank you, Laura, for having me today. Uh, it's been amazing to share space with everyone and be in conversation um, you know, around the work that we're, we're all contributing and, and working towards in the city. Um, the, the majority of, of the work that I do is, is very much so driven by, um, by community and by conversations that um, you know, have been uplifted through, whether it be through neighbors or through um, you know, organizing or even family. And so most of my projects, um, even the ones previous to this, have you know served as as a place or or a space to kind of uplift conversations and to um, you know push consciousness, but also have you know a place to engage in in challenging um, challenging conversations that might not always be had. And so um, you know I'd hope that that this project, along with you know others, kind of does that and. Um, just by being able to be in spaces with other artists too that are that are on display, um, I, I feel like it's very much so doing that and and just having people come visit um, and see the exhibit. You know those conversations kind of were already happening while we were there, which is amazing. And so that that leads to kind of just talking a little bit about the project that I have on display. Um, the project is called Nuestro Barrio No Se Vende, uh, which is translates to Our Hood Is Not For For Sale. Um, and it, it very much so serves as a you know conversational piece to kind of uplift the ways that our neighborhoods are changing in Detroit. Um, and and my my work right now specifically to Southwest Detroit, but these are very much so narratives and conversations that um, can also be in solidarity with other neighborhoods and and, and folks, because um, at the end of the day, it's it's impacting um, you know our city. And so for me, this, this work is to be in conversation about the ways that um, you know, working class communities of color are oftentimes erased and displaced and um, end up being sites for gentrification and for, for displacement, um, while also kind of acknowledging the ways that historically, um, you know, these are patterns and these, these are things that have been happening in, in our city. And so how are we looking at the historical ways that this um, that these phenomena are kind of continuing to be perpetuated within our neighborhoods and how are we you know uplifting the voice of, of folks um, within the city who have very much so fostered the communities and and the liveliness that we all grew up in and that we all love so much you know how are we holding folks who have been here um, and who have been kind of growing these spaces while also acknowledging the fact that obviously revitalization and 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 um, you know, development as long as it's community centered is 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 needed in any city, um, and and I think it's not to negate those conversations or to negate the fact that you know uh, we should be pro progressing and, and growing economically and socially, um, but how do we make sure that we're doing it while still hoping while still holding you know the folks of our city and our communities, um, and and while not always pushing like this new new Detroit agenda that leaves um, leaves us out of that narrative. And so this project um, kind of came about because I have been trying to process the ways that, um, 
you know, I've been seeing changes within my own neighborhood. I was born and raised in Southwest Detroit, um, Clark and Werner, what's up? <laughs> and, um, you know, so I was, I was born and raised in the city and, and my, my family came here um, in, in the, the 50s from Mexico and from Texas. And so that's a narrative that's, that's really common um, within our neighborhood and, and even more so folks obviously still have um, even closer roots to, to that story. Than I do, but um, you know, we obviously grew up in a very close knit space and a close knit community in the '90s and 2000s, and we also went through a lot too together. Um, but we've, you know, there's been a lot of changes that have been happening in our neighborhoods, and and a lot of conversations that folks are kind of just having having informally, like by noticing things. Um, and so, as I'm kind of trying to figure out how to like process myself, I feel like it it's important to have this conversation like with others too. Um, and so this this project is kind of essentially meant to just highlight the different the different narratives of um, you know Southwest Detroit folks and Detroit folks and the ways that Detroit makes them them and how Detroit in their community has held them um, and also acknowledging too like how do we hold um, you know folks that that are coming and wanting to contribute want to be very intentional in a great way about being immersed in our communities and. I think these conversations can be can be taboo to have, um, and so I think you know it's important that that we kind of talk about them. And the first way to do that is to very much situate like why home and why Detroit and why our communities are so important to us. Um, and so this project is just kind of an introduction to to doing that, to to having different perspectives and different like stories about folks who grew up you know around here in Southwest and Detroit and and experiences that. Um, you know, they hold dear to their heart and, and their families hold dear to their heart and to hopefully situate and like acknowledge like why uh, why our communities are so important to us and our neighborhoods are, are important to us um, and why that can be threatened um, when displacement and gentrification becomes a factor. Um, and so that's that's just a little a little bit of, um, you know, why why I kind of began this project and it originally began as um, kind of like a short film and and um, and I think I've I wanted to kind of make it more multimodal and um, and more mixed media um, because of the ways that you know the work kind of just represents and uplifts itself. Um, I think through obviously through photo, but through audio too, um, and not even just that, but bringing bringing the the objects and bringing objects and memories into this as well um, that can can be seen by watching a film or looking at just a photo, but I think being able to hold, you know, like objects and things that are important to families and to, important to people um, along with, you know, coupling that along with like photo and video and audio is like really important, um, I think, so that people can kind of understand um, why these experiences are, are so important to us. And so um, that's that's just a little bit about about the work and I don't know where it's gonna when it where it's gonna go. I think you know a lot of my projects end up being long term, and I think that this is um, definitely a conversation that's gonna be continued to have. And and um, I also um, you know want it to be bilingual as well. Um, and so that's another aspect of of the project that in bringing in um, you know voices and and having and making sure that it's accessible um, and it can be talked about within communities and and not just only shared within. Um, you know, artist spaces, but that this work can be in conversation with with communities as well. Absolutely. Uh, you made a lot of valid points about, you know, integrating the actual people in the community. You know, innovation is inevitable, but you have to make sure you pull in the elders, the people who've been there for decades, the people who have stake in this community. And you have three very important interviews in that piece. So I wanted to ask, you know, one, how did that come about? You know, uh, and I only can imagine, you know, them bring up a lot of sensitive topics, a lot of precious topics, you know, like you mentioned, the object, you know, being a part of your piece, you know, photo, you know, th these are precious things and precious matters, you know, and it can be a little bit complicated bringing, bringing these to light, especially if you are a, a, a person who has been affected by displacement or have been forcibly evicted. So, you know, how do these interviews come about? And, you know, were there actual practices that you use to, to, to make them be in a comfortable space to talk about something so sensitive? 
for sure. Um, you know, I, I think I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get, you know, pers like perspectives, perspectives and, and narratives of uh, folks who grew up in Southwest, but also grew up in different parts of Southwest. Um, and, and so both, um, both my friends who I interviewed, they both grew up in Southwest, but they grew up in kind of like different ends of Southwest. Um, and there's even other ends, you know, in Southwest that obviously weren't included, but I think um, making sure to include like just the, the collectiveness and the, the community aspect of how that was, how the community and, and like collectivist nature of Southwest is kind of threaded across all of our neighborhoods in a lot of ways and how many of us grew up that way. And so these are, you know, folks that are friends and that I'm in community with, but um, they also have different stories in the sense of like, what they did growing up that made them kind of you know uh, feel 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 loved by Southwest and feel love like feel as a Detroiter, um, and and I began it with you know just also with my mom's narrative. Uh, my mom is sixty seven and she was uh, born and raised in Southwest. She you know went to Redeemer. She um, you know she's she's kind of she's been in the community for for her whole life, um, and she was very active. Um, you know. Um, active in, in kind of movement spaces and political spaces when she was younger. Um, and, and within the past couple of years, you know, she's kind of taken a break, but I was very much so raised around, you know, like organizers and leaders and activists and very much so in those, and around artists and very much so in those spaces. And so I really wanted to um, kind of uplift the multifaceted like identities and like ways that I associate with Southwest, but like through other narratives as well and, and kind of shedding light on the complexities of also like who we are as Detroiters and how we can be Detroiters. And I mean, we all have like different stories and narratives, but like there's still like these these common themes that emerge. And so, um, you know, I, I wanted to interview my mom because um, unfortunately my, my grandparents are no longer living, um, but they, uh, my grandparents, you know, were here in the fifties and the sixties when when there was a huge influx of, of um, Mexicans kind of coming to Detroit. And so my mom always talks about just how she was raised in community and all the ways that, you know, um, Mexicans and other Latin Americans who came here kind of created, you know, these ethnic enclaves and these ways to celebrate culture and celebrate themselves and celebrate tradition. And, um, you know, all the ways that it was very much so present and visible. And I think it was it's important to acknowledge the ways that like historically, you know, like Black Detroiters and Latin American Detroiters and just Detroiters in general have kind of set the the foundation for living in like that joy, and um, and uplifting it because it set the foundation for like why we're able to live out loud now, um, and so I think like it, it's an example of kind of the ways that like we resisted. Um, and, and resisted or tried to resist kind of assimilation and, and conformity, even though those things were still very much so present even in, in my family. But it shows, you know, just the ways that our communities very much so tried to resist and say like, no, we're here and we're showing up and, and we wanna live out loud in this way. And so I just think talking about the histories of the ways that like, you know, my mom would, you know, my grandparents would, you know, go to bailes every weekend and, and they would all play you know, like canasta and with their friends and be up to like three in the morning and and they would play music and, and be dancing all the time and, and how like dancing and music um, was such a huge part of just, you know, growing up here and and her growing up here and my grandparents growing up here. And it was kind of how I was raised too. Like I was raised very much so like culturally, like with dance and music and food and, and language in Southwest. And so I want to kind of situate like the history of, you know, why it's so important. It was so important for my mom to continue that with us, like in raising her kids and um, how it's kind of like made her who she is. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, like we don't always have these narratives and these documenting moments of, of those elders. And so I think it's so, it's so important to try to document um, these narratives and these stories because you know, we don't always have them if, if they're not here. And so I wanted to provide some like an elder narrative, but even talking about even before, um, and then it, so that it can kind of situate, you know, how um, how we're socialized now and why why that culture and, and those things are so important to us. 
Um, and, and again, like my, the other two interviews kind of feed, feed off of that in the sense that, um, you know, they talk about culture, they talk about art, they talk about, you know, just growing up on the block and little things that were important. Like, uh, I think Jay was talking about, like, you know, we always had to mold the, mold the backyard and like, everybody knows when you grow up in trade, some of us have like really big yards and just having to like wake up and do yard work and, um, you know, and, and just kind of going to a friend's house down the block and being like, hey, can you play today? And then they'd be like, no or yes. And like, mm -hmm. so those are things that like, I feel like <clears throat> when we're older um, or now that things are kind of shifting and changing, not only because of like technology and things, but, you know, those are stories that like I hold dear to my heart, like just the experience of just going down the block and like being able to play and like have friends or we would all walk to you know Clark Park I grew up by Clark Park and we would um you know we'd collect people on the way and we would just and then we'd go to like the party store we'd go to you know because you know how liquor stores and party stores are kind of like our little our spaces and gas stations so we would always go to like a specific party store and we'd buy like bolis which are um like ice cream but they're frozen like popsicles there you go um so we'd go to like one one liquor store and one party store and get like bolis and like we'd go to the gas station and get a slushy and like it was just like these normal things that we all would do and, and we'd have like five or six dollars right we'd be like oh man we can't get the slushy today because we don't got enough like and those are just things that you know we just kind of always did and grew up doing and so I think um you know it's just important to talk about that like in the ways that like you know you know some of us might have not grown up like, you know, with money, but, you know, we always had love and we always kind of found ways to, 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 to be in community with each other. And so just talking about, you know, those things and, and just growing up in the neighborhood, I think is important. Um, and porch culture, right? Porch, porch culture in Detroit is super huge. Um, and I think like trying to bring in those, those narratives because those are kind of like similar to other cities too that experience, that are experiencing this in other parts of Detroit. And so, I wanted to really kind of uplift within interviews, just like, just how was it for you growing up here? Like, um, you know, and talking about the challenges and stuff too, like, I don't, you know, want to negate that either, but also not looking at it always from a deficit mindset, which I think a lot of folks do when they talk about Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like holding, holding both realities, but uplifting, like why it was just so precious and important to like, like growing up here what, and why it was so, you know, important to us and it might be different. Um, and so I think that's kind of where the conversations led with with my two friends is just them talking about growing up, um, you know, on the black and how their experiences were the same or different and and why um, and how it's kind of come back full circle because both of them, you know, do work within the community and still and, and so us being, you know, I'm 30 and so us being kind of like 30 and, and just reflecting on um, where we're at now and, and what we're doing within community now compared to like just growing up here and, and and trying to kind of really envision and, and see like what the future of of this city is and how we can contribute to that. Um, and so I think that's another aspect of, you know, like my work where I'd like to, you know, and, and kind of take it of just, you know, not only talking about the, the past and the current, but also like the future. And so how are we bringing in youth <clears throat> into this conversation? How are we bringing elders into this conversation to really envision like the, the future of Detroit, but like the future of Detroit by Detroiters. Um, and so I think that's, you know, like kind of common thing that was also kind of like uplifted in the conversations about talking about like, where do you see Detroit or, you know, where, how do you envision, um, you know, things going if it, if, it was, if it was going in a way that kind of holds all of us and hold, holds these narratives and these experiences, like what, it, what can that look like? Um, and I think there's a lot of dreaming that, you know, we do and we want to do and we have been doing for decades and generations and ancestrally, right? Um, these aren't new, like these, I should say like these ways that of practicing and being in conversation and, and narrating like aren't new, like our ancestors have been doing this for, for centuries. And so I think like really tapping in and, and like understanding like what that looks like to do collectively. Um, and I think that that does that with these other projects, right? Like my project talks to the Black Bottom Archive uh, project as well, because of the ways that, you know, what's happening, what had happened with Black Bottom is happening still in Detroit um, uh, with, with freeways and other things and displacement. And so these are histories, but they're also kind of telling us like, this is what has happened before. 
Um, and so my project talks to that. My project also talks to, you know, Bryce's project. Um, and it's actually funny because we have a sign in front of our house that says, you know, hood close to gentrifiers. And um, my mom, you know, we we kind of watch how people take it in. And, um, and, and so that's been a part of two of even, like there's been conversations that have been started just because we have a sign, you know, in front of our yard and like people want to talk about it. And, and um, so even just experiencing that has been really interesting and important because it's like, yeah, let's talk about it. Like, why do you feel some type of way? Because I have this, like, you know, like, let's, let's talk about these things. And so um, I think like a lot of, you know, all of our work talks to each other um, and, and the same, and, and even though it's done differently, it's kind of having the same conversation. And so that's what I would hope that that it does do and it continues to do and that it's led by, you know, not me, like me being, a, you know, the, the facilitator of this, but like, you know, these conversations sh should be led like our, by our people. And um, I think that's that's something that has to be continued to, to be uplifted. Absolutely. Uh, so many interesting factors and just about one ownership, maintaining the archive, um, the importance of joy in speaking about home, the importance of, you know, investing in the future community, the, the children now, you know, how can they um, be involved and of course, make a better way for displacement to not be a non-existent thing in a, in a perfect world in the future. So all it can do is continuously progress. And so that actually wants me to ask, you had mentioned before, you know, you want to see this continue in, in, in another, another kind of space or another uh, way of, of creating maybe uh, more interviews or, or something in that nature. So yeah, how do you see your specific project maybe kind of expanding in a bit? For sure. Um, I definitely want to bring in, you know, a lot, a lot more interviews and, and narratives. And so my hope is to expand it this summer. Um, and so there, you know, there are a couple like elders that I, or a few elders that I kind of, that I definitely want to talk to and, and document kind of just their experiences. Um, but I want to obviously bring in youth too, um, to the conversation. And so um, I, I definitely see myself bringing in a lot more people um, and, and I don't really see it as like capping, like, you know, I'm going to cap how many people because I don't, I don't see it as that either. Um, I mean, there's so many stories out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, there's so many, there's so many stories. So I just think like, I want it, I want it to happen like naturally and stuff too. And, and one, actually the conversation had originally started when I was doing it more so like from a film perspective of talking about housing and like, um, because I was having conversations with friends that are my age and that are your age too. And like the difficulty of, of kind of growing up here or even being somebody who's who's been here for, you know, who's immigrated here um, and how like we can't afford to buy houses here um, and we can't like continue that legacy or, or, you know, the ways that we've, you know, folks have created a home here. Like, it's just not really uh, feasible to really do in the same ways that like my mom was able to do or my mom's generation was able to do for us and so that's kind of how one of the convert like it you know I was really frustrated because I was like talking to all my friends who you know I grew up with went to high school with and like they were like we can't even buy a house here anymore we can't afford so a lot of folks are going down river a lot of folks are going other spaces which is cool and all but at the same time like you know historically what has that done to our people right um, and so I think, you know, uplifting to like the rural housing and justice act aspect of it is is a, is a piece that I think is probably between other projects, but also like this one too. Um, so I think talking even just about the realities of like going through the housing process and like trying to buy a house like my age and somebody who obviously couldn't establish credit at a young age. Um, and so I heard didn't necessarily have these kind of stepping stones that like some privileged youth end up having um because we're all building it right we're like the first one of the first gens trying to build these things and so just the inequity even in that experience um so i think like bringing in that and i also again like want it to be bilingual like uh, I, I do want my work to also be in spanish um and, and so that i'm able to document you know narratives in, in spanish as well um because that's you know those communities and are really important to to the story um, and, and language can be a barrier to kind of like mm -hmm. not uplifting certain stories. And so I would hope to, to also just make sure that my project is accessible um, 
language wise and um and just documents it also just like the name itself uh you know I wanted to be in Spanish and most of my uh titles of my projects are in Spanish and that's intentional and so um I want to be able to take it a step further and have you know not not only the panel in English but also in Spanish and so these conversations too um and it's going to take me you know coming back out of like my shelf interviewing in Spanish which I haven't done in a long time but it'll be you know important to do too mm -hmm. um so that's it that's kind of where I see some of it going um I, I don't necessarily have like a, a full structure for for what it can look like but I know that I, I wanted to grow um and it has so much potential to grow because there's so many folks who do want to talk about it um and I think making sure too that you know it it, it does bring up conversations and and will allow this conversation to be less taboo because again like there are certain like you know words that you say and like people automatically get like afraid right mm -hmm. um and so it's like well we have to be able to like talk about these things and also not only from a jargon perspective we have to be able to talk about it in a way that um isn't always so jargony and so i think just growing it in that way and making making sure that whoever wants to be a part of it and who's documented is a part of it um and so this is yeah it's only only just the beginning but i think you know it has it has room to definitely include a lot a lot more people Oh yes, absolutely it does. So I'm I'm really excited to hear more about that when it does grow into something more expansive. Um, but you began something very beautiful. So I just want to send my congratulations to you. It was an amazing project, and I've had gotten a lot of great, amazing feedback, and I've gotten a lot of great uh, effectiveness conversation in terms of listening. You know, because it, it's a very um, you have to be engaged in, in the conversation. So yes, I, I, I do believe it will grow and I do believe it will give a, a voice to those who, who need to be heard. So thank you again, Rebecca, so much. It was a great time to talk with you today. Um, do you wanna give out any information on people how to get in contact with you, any possible ways to maybe have a collaboration if that's something in the near future? Um, so how can anybody you know learn more about you and your work? Yeah, for sure. Um, you all can always, you know, contact me through email. My um, my emails are maxon m a x o n at umich.edu. Um, so if anybody wants to collab or just even be in conversation, um, you all can always hit me up through through email. And I'm I'm always open. And even if you're a type of person who just wants to like get on the phone and talk about stuff like this, I'm you know I'm always down for that too. So um, that that's one way to reach out um, reach out to me. And and again, I'm always I'm always interested in like learning and being in community with folks so i'm definitely open open for for further conversations around this wonderful well finding home stories of displacement again is running until may 21st at detroit artist market and you can actually learn more about rebecca's piece uh, on their website www.detroitartistmarket.org so thank you again rebecca i'll see you soon thank you